A.W. Tozer said it well. He's one of the most quotable Christian authors in, in, in the whole history of the Christian church. He said, a true and safe leader is likely to be one who has no desire to lead, but is forced into a position of leadership by the inward pressure of the Holy Spirit and the press of the external situation. Uh, the, that is so well said. I think I said that a, a few weeks ago, and then I came across this quote, and I thought, well, but, well, you've got to share that one. Um, the, the best leaders, as I've seen over the years, are those who say, when I go to them and I say, hey, your name has been given for a deacon or an elder, uh, we'd like for you to consider it, pray with it, talk to your spouse, and uh, pray about it, and we'd like for you to come on board if it, you think it's God's will. And oftentimes, uh, there are those, not all, but some who say, I, I don't feel worthy of that. I don't feel like I deserve that. I don't, I, I don't, you got the wrong guy. And I say, well, <laughs> that's not what the leaders think. That's not what other people in the church think as well. So uh, pray about it. And those are the kind of people that, again, they're, they're, they're not hungry for the spotlight. They're not trying to put themselves afford when there's an opportunity. In fact, they've, those are the ones I can name, and I can list you a number of them. They're the ones who back away from the spotlight, unless you say, hey, you got to say something. <laughs> well, we're in the middle of a series on the making of a spiritual leader, and, and as you look for a senior pastor, you want a servant leader, no doubt. You want a, a servant leader, one who's humble, but you also want a spiritual leader. You want a spiritual leader. And no doubt you want one who is, a, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, who is a player coach. He's a, he's a team player, and yet at the same time he's trained, he's been, he has experience, and he's hopefully, uh, certainly growing in the Lord. And so he is to be recognized and respected for that leadership, spiritual leadership in his life as well. Uh, and if, you know, when you look for a model for leadership, and we've looked at Peter the last two weeks, and before that, we looked at what Paul had to say in First Timothy about what a leader, in Titus as well, about what a leader, the qualities of a leader. But today we're going to look at Paul. Paul, I don't think you can go anywhere else. You certainly can't go outside the Bible and find a better model for leadership than that of the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to take you somewhere before we get to our passage. I want to take you somewhere to kind of set the stage because when we think of Paul... When we think of Paul, we think of this guy who's kind of a, you know, he's kind of the Rambo. He just kind of walks through spiritually. And in fact, someone said in one of my churches, previous church, someone said to me once, said, you know, Paul, he, he, used, he used the term, a spiritual Rambo. He was just a spiritual Rambo. He just kind of walked through, you know, and just, and just it seemed like nothing ever fazed him. And my answer to that was, have you ever read 2 Corinthians? <laughs> I, I, I want to show you that Paul was a vulnerable, real individual who had struggles just like every person sitting in this church today and the one standing as well. I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we want to pick it up. We don't have time to read the whole section. Uh, Paul is waiting for news from Corinth. There are actually, we know of two books that Paul wrote, two letters, epistles that Paul wrote to Corinth. Actually, there were at least three and probably four. Two of them, one or two of them have been lost. And Paul was kind of on edge about what was going on and the opposition that he was getting from Corinth. And so here, Paul, in chapter 7, really kind of opens up his heart. In fact, my Bible simply has the heading of the beginning of the chapter. Paul reveals his heart. That's the best way to say it. Paul really reveals his heart here. But let's pick it up. We don't have time to read the whole second. Let's pick it up in verse 4. He says, Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy and all affliction. Now watch this. He's saying, this is where I am now, but I wasn't there bef before this. He says, for even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side. Paul? Afflicted? 
I didn't think anything phased you. We were afflicted on every side, conflict without fear within. Paul, you had fear? Wait a minute, that's not the Paul we read about, right? <laughs> no. Now watch this. God who comforts the depressed. What's the intimation there? Paul is saying, is intimating, I've been depressed. No other way to read that, folks. But God who comforts us, the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now I want to show you how this is, how Paul is so real here. Paul is not one who lords it over his disciples or his, uh, those that he has mentored, one being Titus. He says, God comforted me by the coming of my disciple, Titus, by the young man, Titus. What do we do today in our churches? No, no, I can't let anybody know that I'm struggling, especially my, those I disciple, those I'm mentoring. No, no. <laughs> and Paul said, I was struggling. I needed God's comfort. And God sent this young man, and he comforted me. Huh. Now, it's against that backdrop. Now, I want you to understand Paul's leadership. Because in our passage today, we see Paul standing strong as a leader. But I want you to recognize the fact that a real leader is not immune to struggles and heartaches and even at times discouragement and depression. Let's turn to Acts chapter 27. Now, the passage today, Paul is being escorted to Rome from Caesarea. He's about to appear before the emperor. In the heart of our message, really, as far as the characteristics that we're going to pull out as far as the leader is concerned, really are in the, uh, later on in the passage in verses one through, I mean, 11 through 26. But we're going to kind of do a flyover of the beginning of this passage to kind of set the stage for what we're going to discuss. Now in Acts 27, let's pick it up in verse 1. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to the centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Adrian, Adramidian, I should say, ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. The next day we put in Sidon, put at, in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and to receive care. From there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Now, what's going on here? Well, the major personalities that are introduced here in this passage, in the first part of this passage. First, of course, is Paul. He stands at center stage, not just as an apostle, mind you, but as a leader. And you're going to see some of the leadership traits bleeding through. He is delivered, Paul is delivered to a centurion, Julius is his name. Uh, Julius was of the Augustan cohort. Now, the Augustan cohort was a special group of soldiers, a unit of soldiers that were chosen by the emperor himself. They had a special connection with the emperor. And, of course, Julius is, seems to be very kind-hearted to the apostle Paul. Uh, he treats him with great courtesy. In fact, some scholars believe that Festus, who was the governor of Judea at the time, had told, had whispered in Julius' ear, so to speak, that this man is innocent. He's not guilty. Treat him well. And so there's, Paul is treated with great trust. And, and of course, with him that, who travels is the man known as Dr. Luke, the one who has written or who wrote this, this uh, book of Acts. And obviously he has been invited to go along with him because he is, Dr. Luke is a physician. 
which seems to underscore the fact that, as many scholars believe, Paul was suffering with some physical ailment at this time, some physical disease, and we don't know what. But nonetheless, he, the, Luke is allowed to go with him as his physician. Otherwise, he would have to go, he would have to be qualified as a slave to be able to go with him, as was Aristarchus. Aristarchus was someone he met at Thessalonica on his second missionary journey, who now has faithfully accompanied the Apostle Paul wherever he's gone. The, the interesting thing about this, though, is that, again, the fact that Aristarchus was willing to lure himself and to go as a classified slave tells you something about the heart of Aristarchus. One thing that somebody, in one of my commentaries I was reading on leadership, one thing that one of the commentators said is a real leader has people who will follow him, who will love him. And uh, I say, I say they, they'll have people who will take a bullet for them, so to speak. Paul had Aristarchus. So great was his love of Paul, so strong was his desire to minister to his needs that he volunteered to serve in that capacity. Now, they found a small vessel which is beating its way up the coast of Palestine towards what today is we call Asia Minor or Turkey. And the voyage continues all the way and it sails from Sidon. Now let's pick it back up in verse 4. For there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us aboard it. And when we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty, had, we had arrived off of Nidus, and since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete at Simone. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to the place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Now, they immediately encounter winds, bad winds, strong winds. The winds at this particular time of the year usually blew from the northeast which would help them on their way to Rome. However, now they are encountering winds that are blowing from the northwest, which is blowing against them on their way to Rome. They finally arrive at, uh, at a Lu Lucian port known as Myra, where they find a much larger vessel, about 120 feet, much longer than what they, were, they had. And that's by, by modern measurements today, that's a pretty good sized ship. Uh, and they, this was a grain ship that they found, grain of wheat from, that come from Egypt. And so the centurion evidently leases the vessel because he is in charge of it for the rest of the voyage. But once again, they run into winds that are contrary to where they're going. So with great difficulty, what they have to do, they have to, they're making slow progress, and they're zigzagging, trying to get to Rome. But after several days of sailing, they have made only a couple hundred miles. That sounds like a pretty good distance, but not for them. And so they, they slide down under the lee or the shelter of the island of Crete in order that they make headway, uh, at, make any type of headway at all. Now, the difficulty they met raises a question which we, I can't, going through this passage, though it's not the main point, it's a question that I think we all have to face, and we, we do face, I should say, and we have to ask often is, here's Paul, he is in the will of God, God has told him, Paul, you are to go to Rome and you are to stand before the emperor, and yet he's in the center of God's purpose and plan and will for him, and yet great difficulty has come. So what, it begs the question, why is it that you can be in the will of God, or how is it that Paul could be in the will of God, and yet face great difficulty here in the very beginning? That's a question we often ask, isn't it? I thought, God, I thought this was God's will. I thought he seemed to be clear to me. 
And here's, again, this is not one of my major points about a leader, but I do believe it is one that, uh, that is true to a leader. You see, a leader recognizes that often, as you should look at those in the Old Testament, a leader recognizes that often being in the center of God's will will mean, in the beginning, great difficulty. A leader gives divine viewpoint when everybody else in the boat and everywhere else in the church are whining and crying. And saying, this, Remember the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness? God led them out, performed not 10 miracles, 11 miracles. Led them out of Egypt and then they came to just a no water situation. Now a no water situation would seem big for any person, but in comparison to the miracles that God had pulled off this, up to that point, no water is not a problem at all. And yet what did they do? They griped and complained. But see the divine, the, the, the leader says, no, 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 we're not thinking like God wants us to think. We're not thinking with divine viewpoint. Now, Again, that's not one of my major points, but I think it's something that we need to keep in mind that when you are in God's will does not mean that you will not face, especially in the beginning, great hardship. But our question today that I think we gather from this passage is what characteristics does the Apostle Paul demonstrate as a leader? Well, let's begin reading in verse 9. He says, When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. <laughs> and he said to them, Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and of the ship, but also of our lives. You know, you notice now, even though Paul is a prisoner, he is standing up and speaking, and they, he's given great freedom, consideration at this point. In fact, they seem to be very courteous to him. His counsel now, though, is based upon not a prophetic gift, not a vision, but it's based upon the fact of common sense, just good judgment. And by the way, the, the fast had already occurred, and that fast was a reference to the day, the feast, uh, the fast on the Day of, of Atonement of the Jews, which means that it's early October. So they're soon, they're going to soon be hitting the, the blasts of, of, the, of the late fall and then into winter. So, and during this time, by the way, on the Mediterranean, the great storms would arise, which had happened here. So Paul, knowing this, advises them that they winter in this small port where they are, Fair Haven. So here's my first characteristic I see in this passage of a real leader. A spiritual leader makes wise decisions. A spiritual leader makes wise decisions. And here's my sub, sub line here on this. This will give it a little more clarity. A spiritual leader uses good judgment. A spiritual leader is wise. What's wisdom versus knowledge? You may know the word of God, but wisdom is the ability to see how it applies in life's circumstances. My great passion has always been for believers over the years is to help believers not just know the word, but see how it applies, how to take principles and turn those around and apply them to everyday life and circumstances. See, according to the world's view, a leader is a risk taker. He's willing to roll the dice. This doesn't mean that a leader will not take some calculated risks, but a good leader never makes a decision or takes a risk that's a major gamble. A good leader will not subject his people to unnecessary hazards. The Apostle Paul's advice was good advice, exercising good judgment, just common sense and good judgment. Over the years, again, I've had many years of experience, not just as a pastor, but even on a district board for six years in Southern California for denomination or affiliation out there, the free church. And I've seen pastors i've seen lay leaders make decisions that just put me in awe and i've said many times 
It is God's grace and it is a testament to the Spirit of God that any of the churches keep the doors open based on some of the decisions I've seen over the years. Too many young men in ministry make impetuous decisions. They leave without looking where they are going. I had a mentor once who said, Byron, you know, I was about to go into my first church, and he'd been, spent two years mentoring me. He said, Byron, he said, make haste slowly. He says, when you go in, listen. Don't talk, listen to the hearts of the people. What's their passions? And listen. And be careful. That was some of the greatest counsel I ever got. Too many young ministers and young leaders for that matter don't count the cost. They aren't cautious enough. They don't measure the cost enough the Apostle Paul warned young Timothy about youthful lust. And he wasn't talking about sexual lust. Youthful lust is in the impetuous desire to run ahead of people and to do it on their own. The quickest way to lose credibility as a pastor or a leader, for that matter, is to lead your people down a blind alley over a cliff by making a foolish decision. There are two types, of decisions, uh, two types of decisions or mistakes, mistakes that come from decisions. I've categorized them, and this is, the, <laughs> these are my, this is mine. This is not written in any book anywhere. There are benign mistakes. Pastors will make mistakes. Allow your pastor to make mistakes. I've made mistakes. But there are benign mistakes that are just mistakes. Now, in some churches, and I've, I've mentored some young pastors, and in some churches, They've talked to me, and, and, and they've made mistakes, but they've been crucified by that mistake. Where's the grace? And then there, there's what I called terminal mistakes. Terminal mistakes is when you make a decision and you lose your credibility because it's so foolish, and quite frankly, so dumb, that people think, What's wrong with this guy? Every pastor and leader is going to make a mistake. One thing I've, especially, and, and by the way, especially when it, comes when, when it comes to leading your congregation on a new venture that may cause something financially. One of the things I've, and I've done this also with now I'm leading homeowners association, at least I've led it for 14 years. And I've often thought, okay, when, when, when you come to a decision, you say, we're going to spend God's people's money. And that's the way I view it. It's God's people's money. And that's God's ultimately. But they have the right for us to be accountable, to, leaders to be accountable to them. And I've often thought, can I, st when we come to a venture, can we stand up in front of a con can I stand up in front of a congregation and with confidence justify that decision? And that's what I think when I'm in a board meeting and I'm discussing. That's what I'm thinking. Can I stand up? And if I can't, I'm going to say, and I've said it, guys, we can't do this. I'm not standing. I'm not, I, I can't do that. Now we work on a unanimity principle, so we all have to be together in our leadership. If I envision myself being uncomfortable or feeling like I've got to do a song and dance, no way I'm going to do that. Look, good leaders are analytical. They understand when there's a calculated risk. And when they know that, they at least have a contingency plan as a backup. A leader has wisdom. I can't say that enough. I had a mentor, the same mentor I shared with you, used to say to me, Byron, pray for wisdom and, and balance every day. Balance as a Christian, not too far one way or the other, in wisdom. And I've tried to follow that. And this guy was a, was a giant in the faith. Well, the Apostle Paul counsel was overruled. The captain and the owner of the ship who are aboard and the majority of the crew differed with him. But Luke was careful to record the reason why 
they had taken one look at this dinky town known as Fairhaven, and they decided, this is not a place that we want to spend the winter. This is not a very exciting town. No, we, we, we want to go somewhere else to where we can spend the winter. And so, so they prevailed upon the centurion, who evidently had the last word, and they said, let's get to Phoenix, a harbor about 50 miles up the coast of Crete. But as one of the old golden oldies used to say, there's a lot can happen before you get to Phoenix, right? You heard that song? Well, there's another reason why the captain wanted to go to, the next, to that destination. Because he knew if they were stuck in Fair Haven, if they wintered in Fair Haven, he would have to support, pay for those, all those people who worked on his boat during the duration of the winter. And so he, he wanted to get out of there as well. Well, Paul is well aware of that, and he has warned them, but they pay no attention to him. So the next section brings us the account of the storm that arose. Let's pick it up in verse 14. But before very long, they rushed down from the land. A, uh, very long, they rushed down from the land a violent wind called Uraquilo. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat um, under control. And after they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship. Basically, they were wrapping it like a present, like you wrap a present, trying to keep it from coming apart. And fearing that they might run aground at the shallows of Sardis, they let down the sea anchor and in this way let themselves be driven along. The next day they were being violently stormed, tossed. They began to jettison the cargo. And on the third day they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days in no small storm, was assailing us from there all from there on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned and then verse 21 it says when they had gone a long time without food and then Paul stood up in their midst and said men you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss now remember what the apostle Paul said back in verse verses 9 and 10 he said we shouldn't do this but now what does he say here in verse 21? Now after the fact, he says, should have listened to me. You know, you wouldn't be in this mess that you're in right now. What's the old cliche? I don't, yeah, the, yeah so I told you so. The, the other part of that is I don't, I don't, I don't want to tell you, I don't want to say I told you so, but what? I told you so, right? Yeah. And here's what I get from this. A good leader says what's, what needs to be said, regardless of how unpopular it is. So the spiritual leader, here's number two. A spiritual leader has courage. Especially in the face of opposition. Doesn't mean he's not nervous, but he has courage. He says what needs to be said, says it graciously, hopefully, and, and, and with, with a spirit of, of kindness and meekness. But he's not afraid of speaking the truth when he needs to speak the truth. Whether it's to a, a person in the body of Christ who's, whose behavior is affecting the body or affecting his or her marriage. But he's willing, he has the courage enough to say, hey, this is wrong. I've had counseling sessions where couples in my office or one in my office or another and, and they say this, that, and the other and I say, no, that's not right. You know that's not biblical. Now that doesn't, that doesn't win friends and influence enemies. But the leader has to do that. He has to be willing to stand up before sometimes large groups of previous church fairly good-sized church who had a music director who had a, a moral impropriety 
I've told you some of you that told this story before, but I want to I want to I want these messages transcribed. Uh, I want to keep these messages. He was a choir director, music worship leader. Now, our, our choir at that time was somewhere between 40 and 50 people, plus five more praise band team, praise team, so forth. So they're good-sized people, and he had a moral impropriety, and we took him before the membership of the church, and, and I said to the membership, I said, John has had a moral impropriety, and we are removing him from leading the, the choir, in worship. We didn't spell it out, which I've learned now, you spell it out, as ugly as it might be. He had two boys in the church, young boys, and we, we felt, well, we, we won't try to shield them as much as we could. Well, the result of our not spelling it out is that the choir begins to, where's the grace? Where's the kindness that they preach about? And so one of the elders on the praise team said, Byram, you need to come to a choir practice because they don't know what it is and they think that you guys are on overkill. And so I showed up with unannounced one choir meeting. I said, I hear there's some questions about what John has done. Let me spell it out for you folks. John and ha- has had an adulterous relationship. And he has agreed to go through the restoration process. And we've tried not to air the dirty linen. But obviously I've got to speak the truth to you. Was that fun? Was that something I looked forward to? I was just 42 years old. I was young. Hmm. We had another situation where the elders had to fire a staff member. And our, 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 char- our senior citizens, which were mostly charter members, they'd been there with pastor, the founding pastor who had been there 22 years, and they, they, they had the chapel. Their Sunday school class was held in the chapel. Chapel had about 120 or so, and so they, they'd fill that chapel up. But word got out, I mean, we fired this, this the elders fired this up, staff member but the attorney told the elders and I was in agreement with what took place but they're the ones who took it on and it did a great job the attorney says you there's only so much you can share just in case there would be litigation well word gets out people beginning to talk one of the elders another elder in the who was the the teacher of this these uh, senior folks said you guys better come, Ben. You, Byron, you need to come. Ben was a chairman. You need to come. And I, that was one I, I was real nervous about because you don't want charter members, people who, those are the people who really support the church. But I went. We went. And I said, I said, one of the things that, that's so distasteful uh, as a leader in the church is oftentimes we have to keep silent. And uh, while those others whose behavior is so wrong talk. I said, I'm going to tell you what I, as much as I can tell you. This is what this staff member did. And this is what the elders have done. And that was it. It was over with. It was done. In fact, one of our top businessmen in our church came up to me afterwards and said, I would have fired her long before you guys did. Was that fun? No. But a leader has to know that he, the health of the body is most important. And one person who's in sin cannot be allowed. That's a spiritual leader. I had a, pa- a fellow pastor back when I was in Riverside. When we would meet together guy named Don Smith. He was about nine years older than most of us in the group, but he had a lot of wisdom. And some pastors would greet, we'd meet once a month. And he said one time, I've never forgotten, he said, there are grass fires and there are forest fires in the church. And you've got to determine, you've got to have the wisdom to determine which 
one it is. You say, what, what is that? What do you mean by that? Well, what he meant by that, there are times there are Christians, small pockets of Christians who are going to complain. I mean, they're just going to complain. They're going to be in the flesh. They're going to complain about the pastor, the elders, or the church, or the color of the carpet, or whatever it is. They're going to complain. Those are just benign complaints. But then there are others. There are others who become forest fires. Why? Because their carnality, they're in the flesh and they want their way. Now, I want you to show you that this is nothing new to the church. I want you to go back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, In James chapter 3, verse, beginning, let's pick it up in verse 14. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. Two things there. What is it? Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. Now put that in the context of a leader. A leader, can, uh, people who are potentially, who want to be leaders and who are not qualified to be leaders, will have bitter jealousy. And they'll have selfish ambition. What's selfish ambition? It's my own agenda. There are those who come into the church. I know it's, it's hard to believe, but there are people who come into the church, I've witnessed it over the years, who want to be in charge. They want their way. There's one guy one time came into the church and said, Guys, just want to let you know. Talked to the elders, said, Beware, this could happen. A year and a half later, yep. And one of the elders, Tim Dran, said, Byron, you see things a mile out that we don't see. Yeah, I said, it's because I have experience. You see, there are those sometimes who cannot humble themselves to become a leader. They may be very gifted. They may be great Bible teachers or musicians or whomever they may be. And here's something, over the years I've witnessed, and this is what has, I have been incredulous in seeing this. I'm gonna, uh, over the years I've seen those who oftentimes are fall into the category of what I'm talking about here in James. By the way, let me read on, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. It says, but wisdom, uh, well, we're gonna skip verse 17. Verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there is what? Disorder and every evil thing. Now go drop down to ch- chapter four. By the way, is the chapter break inspired of God? No, no. And it really, it's an unfortunate chapter break here because the flow of thought it continues here. In verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? And he's pointing back. He's talking about what he's been talking. He's referring back to the previous verses. Now look in verse 2. He says, You lust and you do not have. Lust for what? Selfish ambition, bitter jealousy. So you commit murder. He's not talking about physical murder. And by the way, he's not talking about sexual lust. He's talking about the lust of the context here. That it's selfish ambition. You are envious and cannot obtain. So what? You fight and you quarrel. And I know it's hard to believe, but there are people in the church over the years, and they may be your friends or someone else's friends, they mean well sometimes, but they have this ambition to be recognized or to have their way. I can think of two or three, men's in my, two or three men in my ministry who caused conflict, division in one church, moved to another church, and five years later or four years later, they caused the same conflict again. It was never confronted. I'm often uh, uh, amazed that those who, who often can cause this can be people who claim to know God's word and yet they don't. Howard Hendricks said, to know and to not do is not really know at all. But we've got to move on here. In verse 21, of course we see what he said in verse 21. But look in verses 23 and 24 here. In 
in 23, he says, for this very night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and saying, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand before uh, Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. It says, therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. So what do we see here? Paul has, he has courage, and in having courage, he speaks with authority. So here's the third one. The spiritual leader speaks with authority. Not authoritarian, but authority. Paul had, gone, had God's own promise of safety. He was confident that it was true. He knew that God was still in control. So he knew, I believe Paul knew about Psalm 93 that says, More than the sounds of many waters, than the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. In Psalm 89, 9, you rule the swelling of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. The apostle Paul spoke with confidence, boldness, if you will. Why? Because he knew what was true. This remarkable boldness was not born out of self-confidence, It grew out of a complete confidence in God's revelation, God's truth. And when we say that God's spiritual leader speaks with authority, we're not saying that he speaks with this authoritarian attitude. There's a big difference between authoritative speaking and authoritarian. John MacArthur said it this way. The voice of authority must convey strength and power unless you really know what you're talking about. You can't speak clearly or with authority. And if you can't verbally project certainty, confidence, and courage based on knowledge, you'll find it very difficult to lead people. In the Apostle Paul's case, he had a word from God that is what sets a spiritual and biblical leader apart from every other kind. So he speaks with authority. Can you think of somebody in the, in, in the Old Testament? Probably think of several, right? But there's one that I think of and I want to meet this guy when I go to heaven. I want to talk to him because he's kind of, a, he's kind of an enigma. He's, you really don't know a whole lot about him. His name is Caleb. Remember that? And, and you write down this passage and look at it later. We don't have time to go there. But it's Numbers 13, 30 through 33. You remember the, the, they, had the, the, they sent the 12 spies into the land of Canaan. You had, and they came back and you had the majority report and the minority report. The majority report said they're too big. Hey, they're too big. The Nephilim, they're giants in the land. And Caleb says, they, they said, in fact, the people said, we're, we're dwarfs compared to those people. And Caleb comes back and says, God says it's ours. What's the problem here, essentially? There's a book called Conversation with Giants. I don't know if you've ever seen that book. It's a small book. Conversation with Giants by Phyllis Stilwell Prokop. And she, she, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a real small book, but it's very interesting because she kind of carries on this conversation with the giants, David, Saul, uh, Elijah, Elisha, you, you could go on, Solomon, and she kind of carries on this conversation. And I love what she said about Caleb. She says, Caleb, I do not know anything about you before you became a spy. I do not know of your work, but this I know. There was never a need for you to sit in the front row of the meeting when the vote was taken. You did not need to shield your eyes from the lifted hands of others in order that your vote would not be swayed. You trusted your own decision and stood by it while others, other men cringed and the people murmured unceasingly. I can see you stalking up and down, talking with yourself. I can see you clenching your fists and muttering out loud after you return from spying out the land of Canaan. What kind of men are these, you ask? I cannot understand, you say, how any man with God at his side can say that he seems to be as a grasshopper in another man's sight. You see, Caleb spoke with authority because he was confident in God. You want a spiritual leader who speaks with the confidence and authority. Now, let me just mention the last. A spiritual leader edifies. He edifies. That's what Paul did. He said, men, 
You're not, your boat's not going to be saved, but you're going to be saved. So there are things to look up here for. And so here's what I say as a spiritual leader edifies. He builds up others. He doesn't tear people down. And sometimes even when he confronts, he also encourages them. He builds them up as well. I, I, I'll tell this one story and then we'll kind of wrap. There was a guy that and when I was an associate pastor in a church uh, in, in uh, California during seminary. And we had this board. It was a, not an elder board. It was just kind of a mixed board of people, men. And some of them were not real spiritual men. And we had these two big guys. One's name was, I'll say Bob. Uh, and, and, and the other name, I'm going to say Ted. Now, Ted was this giant of a man. In fact, he was one of the founding five men who started the uh, SWAT team at, in L.A. for the L.A. Police Department. And um, he was big. And Brent was not quite as big, but he was a good-sized guy. And I had a rapport with Brent. Brent, I kind of mentored him some. Anyway, we're in a restaurant, and something, some hot topic came up, and these two men stood up and faced off. And I had to think for a second, now, do I want to get between those guys? But I did, and a couple other guys as well. Brent stormed out of the restaurant, left. He was a city manager at the time of another city there in, LA, in the L.A. area. I went to his office. When I walked in, he says to his secretary, hold all calls. And he said, come with me. And we went into this giant weight room off his office. And he just started weeping. Just weeping. I said, Brent, you know what you, what you did today was wrong, right? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, I might as well just quit. I might as well just give up. I, I'm, I'm quitting the board. I'm, I'm quitting. I'm just, I said, no, no, no. I said, Brent, I see leadership in you. It's all over you. You're a city manager. I mean, a, a recreation manager, I should say. I said, Brent, I see you one day being an elder in a church and being a spiritual, godly man. We still get Christmas cards from his wife and him. And he reminded me a couple of years after that, Byron, thank you for believing in me. A spiritual leader may confront, but he also reaffirms his belief in that person, and he sees the worth and value in that person. So we'll, we'll wrap it up with this. Lessons from Paul. Which of these are most needed in your life? Sound judgment, courage, authority, or building up one another? If you don't have Christ, all this will not make sense. And the way to first see that God can build it in you Leadership potential is to know the Savior first and to declare him then as Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the, your word. Thank you, Father, for um, helping us to understand what leadership is. And now, Father, we pray that you'll be glorified in all of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.